Hello again. Welcome to Denton's Tales. Now, the Vikings. The Vikings are seen as big, hairy, strong, powerful warriors, afraid of nothing, unstoppable, almost as something approaching supermen, but without the capes. But of course, that isn't really the case. Now, Vikings, in the strict sense of that term, were mostly men, given that in order to be a Viking, or a, a Viking, as it was in Old Norse, one had to sail off in a ship and do something terribly exciting and ever so macho somewhere else. And of course, it was mostly men who did that. Now, not always, not always, but mostly. So that leaves out most women and children who, obviously, you know, they were not big, hairy, powerful warriors. Well, some of them may have been hairy, but, you know, they weren't big. Though there were a few women who were warriors right enough. And the, the term Viking also doesn't include uh, old or infirm men, or any men for that matter who, for whatever reason, never got into a ship. And there would have been quite a number of those. There would have been men in Scandinavia who never even seen a ship because they lived too far from the coast. Viking was a profession, an occupation, if you like. It was something that one did. You know, you could go Viking, but you couldn't be a Viking. And it wasn't anything to do with national identity. You know, though so often they are seen almost as a, a nationality, as, as one group, all from the same place, which, of course, they were not. From an illness uh, point of view, we are really talking about the Norse people, Scandinavians, be they Norwegians, Danes or Swedes, with a few Frisians uh, thrown in as well. And also, of course, those of them who settled in other lands, such as Britain, uh, Iceland, and here in Ireland, uh, and so on, who are so often incorrectly all classed together as Vikings, which, of course, they were not. Their, their Vikingness was left behind in their ships. When they settled down, they were a settled community. They were no longer Vikings. They were just townspeople, settlers, or whatever other term you want to use for them. And as we shall see, those big, strong, mighty, unstoppable, ever so macho warriors, well, they felt a bit poorly from time to time and took to their beds. Just the same as all those small, weak, very stoppable, and definitely non-macho people everywhere else all throughout history. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry for bursting the bubble of invincible Vikingness. Mighty warriors from the north laid low with a touch of the tummy wobbles. Yes, it certainly doesn't fit the perceived image uh, of the Vikings in popular culture. You know, great big hairy beyond the skull crusher, huge blood dripping axe in hand, taking to his bed with a touch of the old Montezuma's revenge. And if you don't know what that is, Google it. But facts are facts. And in this video, we shall take a light-hearted look at some of those facts. So, come with me through the mists of time, back to the Viking Age. To start with, we know now that the Old Norse had smallpox. Now, that's quite a, a surprising discovery, uh, as it happens, because not only does it give us new information about the Norse people, but it also clears up a medical mystery. While scientists always believed that the uh, variola virus, which causes smallpox, had existed for possibly thousands of years, there was no direct evidence, no concrete scientific proof of it prior to the 17th century. But recently, a team of scientists were able to establish smallpox as being present over 1,400 years ago, and they found it in the Old Norse. They examined 11 Norse graves. Now, the earliest dated from circa 600 AD, which was back in the, in the Vendel era, and the latest almost at the end of the Viking Age, circa 1050 AD. The graves were located in Norway, uh, Denmark, the United Kingdom and Russia, as well as Oland Island, which lies in the Baltic Sea just off the southern coast of Sweden, and it was a very important uh, trading centre in those days. Smallpox was found in the teeth of the skeletons in those graves, though not the same strain of the virus as the one that was finally eradicated worldwide during the 20th century. Uh, 
No, no, the, the, the strain of the virus from well over a thousand years ago, this, this was not identical to the one that produced the dreadful suffering, even blindness and frequently death, that was so common over recent centuries, and as I said, only finally eradicated in the 20th century. And we don't know if it caused similar problems back then or, or not. There's really no way to know that. Even to know if it was fatal or they came out all spotty. You know, we, we, just, we just don't know. But we do know that the people whose remains were found had it in their bloodstream when they died. We've no way, of course, of knowing if it actually caused their death or if they just had it or indeed if they were simply carriers of the virus without actually suffering from it themselves. Given the very extensive travels of the Old Norse, both in the true sense of Vikings as, you know, raiders, seafarers, explorers, and so on, and uh, later as colonists setting up new homes in other lands, we must assume they would have spread the virus from time to time. That would, that would seem logical. We don't know exactly, of course, what caused uh, smallpox or wherever or whenever it originated, nor how the Norse people came to have it. Did they spread it to others on their so far-flung travels, or did they actually acquire it themselves on those travels? But it is thought that it was probably an animal uh, condition that migrated to humans, and it had probably been around long before the Viking Age. Historians think it existed perhaps thousands of years before the Viking Age, but that is based solely on references in ancient writings to the way people died. And so it could have been smallpox, or it could easily have been something else they died of. And given the difference between the virus found in the Norse bodies and the recent form of it, symptoms might well have been quite unlike those that we would associate with the virus uh, today. Now, believe it or not, there is actually an officially recognized Viking disease. Yes, often referred to as the Viking disease though it should be more correctly called the Old Norse disease or the, the Scandinavian disease, since it wasn't related to anything to do with going anywhere in the ship and doing very big, hairy, macho things when they got wherever they got to in the ship. Nor was it related to anything that might be caught from uh, water or fish, harbors or anything connected in any way with seafaring. Its actual name is Deputian's Contracture named for Baron de Putrian, considered to have been the greatest surgeon in France during the 19th century, who first described the mechanics of the condition in 1833. Its proper name is palmar facial fibromatosis. That's a right mouthful for you. Since it affects the palmar fascia, which is the tissue that covers the tendons in the hand. And this tissue becomes tight, it contracts, pulling the fingers downwards towards the palm and it's more likely to affect the middle fingers. It is an inherited uh, condition. It's passed from generation to generation, most commonly found in the Scandinavian countries where it seems to have originated, and in places with a direct historical Scandinavian connection. And for some reason, it's more likely to show itself in persons over 50 years of age and to affect men more than women. Yeah, I think... I think I'm, I think I'm okay at the moment. Having its origins in Scandinavia naturally meant that it was carried to other lands, not by the Viking raiders. That's a very important point. They wouldn't have remained in any one place they attacked long enough to have the, you know, the intimate relations required to have to leave an inherited condition behind them. Unlike smallpox, which of course they could indeed have given to others even in a brief visit, like a raid. And any hanky-panky, shall we say, with the native women occurred when they got them back to wherever they'd come from rather than, you know, where they actually got them. So the, the, the time factor for a quick in-and-out raid means it wasn't the Viking raiders, but rather it was spread by the Norse settlers who remained in other lands and colonized them, setting up villages that grew into towns, large cities, of course, in some case. And later on, they began to intermarry with the local people, uh, thus having plenty of time to, well, um, you know, that, yes, thus spreading any ailments they might have to the native populations that they had settled among. And the Putin's contracture being an inherited condition and requiring, yeah, Panky, panky, would naturally perpetrate itself among those 
populations, making it, correctly speaking, a Norse or Scandinavian disease spread by settled people rather than a Viking disease, which from a terminology uh, point of view could only be spread by raiders, who just didn't have the time to do it. The condition is noticeably prominent in countries that would have a very strong Norse bloodline, countries that were heavily populated by Scandinavian settlers, now they're obviously, I suppose, and it's very prevalent in Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, again, obviously. For example, only 5% of men over 60 have the condition in the United States of America, while 30% have it in Norway. That's a whopping difference. It is most common, however, in Iceland, and that is understandable, given that there was no indigenous population when the Norse settlers arrived. There was no one else there, and thus almost the entire present population is descended from Norse settlers, whereas in other lands the Norse percentage of their populations would have been relatively small. You know, nor would people from other countries have settled later on in Iceland as readily as they might even, even in Scandinavia or anywhere else in Europe, given its location, you know, far out in the stormy Atlantic and not having a particularly warm and sunny climate, it must be said, as well as volcanoes popping up from time to time. It wasn't a particularly desirable uh, location. As I said, the, the contractions are caused by a gradual thickening of tissue under the skin on the palms of the hands, causing the tissue and the tendons to tighten and draw the fingers down, pulling them into a bent position, sometimes right down onto the palm. Even very simple everyday tasks can become difficult or even impossible altogether, depending on how many fingers are affected or how severe the condition becomes. And while it isn't usually uh, painful, it can be painful if an attempt is made to straighten the fingers or you happen to bang your, your hand against uh, something. And it also causes itching. I knew someone who had the condition, a woman in her 70s, and several of her fingers were bent right down, almost almost to the palm, like, like this. She basically had to do anything she wanted to do with her thumb and first finger, which were unaffected, but obviously that considerably reduced her ability to function properly. And the bent fingers were quite painful in her case if she happened, as I said, to touch them against something. In severe cases, a person would be unable to perform even the simplest tasks uh, for themselves. This is a condition you really do not want to have. Mentions of what are clearly Deputian's contracture can be found in the Norse sagas, with people described as having cramped hands or their fingers lying down in the palm. But, not wanting to give up hope, no, no, there was a suggested cure for this complaint. Oh, yes, they had a cure. Uh, it does seem to have been somewhat drastic, to say the least. It could well have resulted in further complications. A woman having her bent fingers fixed by having someone give her a really good hearty kick in her hand. Yes, I'm sure the um, fingers were straightened quite effectively by that treatment, though I'm rather less sure of how well she could have used her hand afterwards. Probably a bit, you know, as they say, don't try this at home. There was also a scald mentioned named Bjorn Krepandi, his nickname meaning crippled hand, and he seems to have been a sufferer of the condition, though there's no record of his ever being kicked, as far as I know. Unfortunately, there is no cure for the disease, though it can be treated in various ways, though often not with very much success, including steroid or enzyme injections or surgery to remove the thickened tissue. But doctors I've spoken to seem to prefer just leaving it alone, given the very poor prognosis of, uh, of any treatment. As I mentioned, kicking the hand is not really an option, nor is hitting it very hard with a big heavy book. There are forms of the contraction found in various countries without any Norse connection, but they seem to be a slightly different uh, thing. They're, they're, not, they're not quite the same. And it seldom ever affects members of non-white races, for some reason which nobody really understands. Aren't they lucky? Now, there is a condition known as trigger finger, which on the surface looks uh, the same. The uh, finger is bent, but it isn't. It is caused by inflammation of the tendons, resulting in a finger becoming stuck in a bent position. You go to use your finger, and it stays in that position. 
While the Peartian's contracture results from thickening of tissue and the resulting pulling of the fingers, quite a different thing. And with trigger finger, the affected finger can often be straightened, though with, with some little effort, of, um, making a clicking or a snapping sound, rather like pulling the trigger on a gun, hence the nickname. You know, if an archaeologist says that during their excavation of a site, they found shit. Well, he or she is not saying they wasted their time. Oh, no, they didn't find anything. No, no, they mean quite literally they found shit. Yeah, shit. And archaeologists love shit. Oh, yes, they just love landing right in it. An ancient and well-used cesspit is a beautiful thing to an archaeologist. Oh, how they love cesspits. The bigger they are and the more produce they uh, have in them, the more they love them. They jump right in there because that can tell a lot about what people ate, what their staple diet was, and also about many illnesses that they may have suffered from, which is quite useful uh, information. In 1972, archaeologists excavating part of the Norse city of Jorvik, or York, as it's called today, in the north of England, at that part of the city called Coppergate, discovered a turd, a turd that would take its place in history, and quite a substantial turd it was too, some eight inches long and two inches wide, thought to be possibly the largest piece of fossilized human feces ever found. Oh, how wonderful was that? And while well, most people, I suppose, would just see it as a load of crap, the archaeologists were ecstatic over this wonderful discovery. I mean, never mind boring, dull old stuff like, you know, gold or silver, weapons or jewelry, a few mummies. Oh, God, no. No, they had hit the holy grail of archaeology. They had found. Shit. Stop the dig. Call the press. We have struck shit. Dr. Andrew Jones, a um, paleoscatologist, there's a lovely word for you, working for the York Archaeological Trust, later summed it up as, and I quote, This is the most exciting piece of excrement I've ever seen. In its own way, it's as irreplaceable as the crown jewels. Yes, you could say he was happy as a pig in, well, you know. A scatologist, uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, is someone who studies poo. A delightful occupation, obviously. Now, this particular piece of amazing poo even has a name. Yes, it, it was so wonderful, they actually named it. And it is called the Lloyd's Bank Coprolite. Since a branch of that very well-known banking establishment occupies the site where it was found, a, a coprolite is what you call a fossilized uh, poo by the way. In the famous alleged words of Michael Caine, not a lot of people know that. Yes, not a lot of people probably want to know it either. As far as I'm aware, the, the sex of whoever was responsible for this wonderful object isn't known, but it has been said that they had not, well, produced, shall we say, for quite a few days, and I'm sure that at the moment of a production back then, uh, that person would never have thought that over a thousand years later, people would be jumping for joy at finding it. I'm sure they were glad to get rid of it. Sad to say, oh, a tale of woe. Sad to say that in 2003, it suffered considerable damage while on exhibition to students when a teacher dropped it and smashed it into three pieces. Oh, oh the horror of it. Was it lost to science? Would its wondrous beauty no longer enthrall visitors eager to gaze upon it? Don't worry, my friends, don't worry. Fear not, it survived. For which, of course, we all give uh, thanks. And it was uh, very carefully glued back together, and it is now displayed in all its ancient pooey glory in the Yorvik Visitor or Viking Centre. I'm sure now that makes you want to make a beeline for, for York and visit the, the Viking Centre. Now, if you thought poo was a bit, uh, well, uh, if you've just had dinner, you might wish to, to pause this video at this point and maybe watch it a bit later. Or if you are of a very sensitive and easily upset disposition, you might perhaps just run it forward a bit. You'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Whoever was responsible for this amazing poo, 
was not a great eater of fruit or vegetables and seems to have lived on meat and grains, such as bran, uh, pollen grains and, and uh, cereal bran being found in the specimen. And not that vegetables weren't uh, available, they were. There was plenty of evidence of them uh, discovered at the same site, as well as fruit and nuts. And most people would probably have eaten a much more varied diet than the individual responsible for the wonderful poo, which I'll come to in a moment. But the real significance of this poo is what it says about health rather than diet, the health of the individual who produced it, obviously, and probably the health of at least a section of the general population as well. How this particular person came to have the medical conditions they did is, I suppose, hard to say in their case, though it would have been related to poor sanitation and, and bad hygiene in some form, including ingestion of water or dirt contaminated with feces or eating unwashed or unpeeled fruit or vegetables. And it doesn't mean that everyone in Jorvik had exactly the same things, nor how bad they would have been in individual cases. But it certainly suggests that it wouldn't have been uncommon. So, what was wrong with this person's poo? Now, this is the good bit. This is the bit I kind of warned you about. Large numbers of eggs were found in it, including whipworm and mawworm infection. And these are parasites that live in the large intestine. And they can produce anything from mild to very severe problems, including inflammation of the bowel, uh, bloody diarrhea, and stomach aches, with symptoms very similar to duodenal or gastric ulcers. And in very severe cases, the parasite can actually migrate to other parts of the body. It even turns up in the head, where they can be found in the nose and the ears. They cause uh, nausea and uh, considerable vomiting, weight loss, and sometimes facial incontinence. So they're not something you really want to have. Mm, I did warn you about this bit. The whipworm, incidentally, is so-called because it's thick at one end and it, it tapers to the other, uh, resembling a whip. And a female worm can shed anything up to, wait for it, 20,000 eggs per day. Makes the average chicken farm look a bit down in numbers, doesn't it? And those eggs then hatch out and they produce larvae in the small intestine and then they move into the large intestine on reaching maturity. Now, that had nothing to do with poor diet or bad sanitation uh, amongst the old Norse. Actually, the, the diet of those times was quite a balanced and a very healthy one. Um, in fact, their food was better quality and more genuinely nutritious than much of what we eat today due to the way we process food and, and, and alter it these days. And their personal hygiene was far higher than most others of their day, which I'll come to in a moment. But as to diet, you see, they didn't add chemicals to everything, probably because they didn't actually have any chemicals. They didn't bulk things with additives or, or fill them with preservatives, no catalogue of E numbers in everything. They didn't consume large quantities of salt or sugar. Of course, they couldn't have used sugar since they didn't actually have any. But nowadays, the actual nutritional value of so many things is reduced by how we process them. Well, like bread and rice, uh, for example. Brown bread is highly nutritious, made from the whole grain. But making it all nice and, and white and soggy in, in the process, well, that gets rid of much of that value. The same as brown rice, which is the way it should be. You know, it has fibrous bran, nutritious germ, and carb-rich endosperm in it. But making it white, because well, we love the look of that lovely, fluffy, white stuff, it removes the bran and the germ, the most nutritious part of it, leaving us with a lot of bulk, but not very much nutrition. Milk. Well, milk uh, has much of its value taken out of it. If you've ever had milk straight from the cow, which I have, you'll know it's absolutely nothing like what you get in the supermarket. It's more like cream. Read the ingredients on and just about anything you buy. And how often do you find it just the natural food stuff as nature intended it? No, there's a, a list of often unpronounceable things the length of your arm that have been added to it. Oh, yes, it may last longer. There may not be funny little things like whipworms that are floating around in it. But the, the nutritional value of much of our food today is far less than it was a thousand years ago. The Vikings, or, well, I should probably say the Old Norse, were hunters as well as fishermen and farmers. 
So much um, was meat, I, I should say, was naturally a, a part of their staple diet. And that could include pork, mutton, deer, goats, uh, elk or, or boars and, and horses as well. Horses were, were uh, quite popular. And their considerable association with the sea, of course, meant that they consumed a great deal of fish of various kinds, as well as seals and, and, and whale meat. The most common methods of cooking meat were boiling it and making it into a, a, a broth or a stew or roasting it, as they usually did with the, the boar meat. Now, bread was very uh, nutritious, made as it was with the whole grain, and it was a standard part of probably every meal. And stale bread, too, that was still usable because they would serve it along with, with a stew to soften it up a bit. Of course, the, the bread might have tiny fragments of stone in it due to milling it, you know, with, with grindstones. You know, that just passed through harmlessly. Talk about roughage, how are you? They were, as I've said, farmers. After all, in order to make bread, you kind of have to grow the stuff that you make it from, something often overlooked by people who see them as nothing more than raiders, you know, sailing around, burning things all over the place. And they had cabbage, carrots and, and turnips in their diet, as well as fruits like apples, plums and various uh, types of berries. There was also something resembling modern yogurt uh, called skier, which is still made in Iceland today. I've had it. It's, uh, it's quite nice, actually. So poor diet was not responsible for Norse illness. It was actually very healthy and balanced. The problems came from other things, principally, of course, various parasites like those lovely, charming little things I've already mentioned. They didn't have microscopes in those days, so of course they were completely unaware from them. Uh, they could they could come from uh, foodstuffs being present in the soil crops were grown in, especially if excrement had been used as fertilizer. And water, of course, was a problem since it was frequently contaminated. But that that was something that was realized at the time. They they knew about that, which is why ale and mead became staple things to drink. You know, it didn't really have uh, so much to do with being. Uh, manly, and I mean the women would have been drinking it too of course, as the fact that they were safe. You know, you might be passed out on the floor, totally unconscious, but you'd be lovely and healthy while you lay there. Another problem was that many families lived in close proximity with their animals. Often there would be just a door between the family room and the room containing the animals. So of course the danger from parasites was really very considerable. Parasites the people, of course, were completely unaware of. And I'm sure children going in and out playing with your goats or lambs and, and, and the like, that would have been a contributing factor. They could easily have brought something back on their hands. Other common illnesses of that time, completely unrelated, of course, to, to parasites, would have been pneumonia and arthritis. Uh, arthritis would have been uh, quite common uh, in uh, both sexes, particularly in the back, the knee and the hands due to farming and other uh, heavy activities that were undertaken. And of course, including the frequent uh, and prolonged rowing of long ships, which could lead to problems with the joints. Now, obviously, sanitation was not particularly good in the ninth century by a long way. And the existence of microorganisms and their relationship with sanitation was unknown. But we do know that the Old Norse had a much better concept of personal hygiene than most other people of that time. And like other people in the Middle Ages, you know, they did have privies, proper toilets located in separate buildings. But that was, that was in the towns where there was an attempt at hygienic uh, conditions. Though produce, of course, brought in from the surrounding countryside could well be infected and, and still cause them problems. Now, it was always assumed that while privies existed in towns, that out in the countryside, people would have, well, they would have done whatever they needed to do wherever they happened to be at the time that they needed to do it. And that it was probably then collected in a bucket and, and spread as fertilizer, as they did with horse droppings, and, and is still done in many places worldwide today. But let me now digress for a moment with a little related story of my own that fits in very nicely with the do it where you are and spread it idea. I lived in North Wales back in the 1960s in quite a remote uh, part of, uh, of Snowdonia. 
in a in a house with you know a, it was a little rural village where drainage sanitation you know, it hadn't quite reached it at that time it was coming it was coming it was close but it hadn't got there yet and in the garden there was a little shed it was rather like a sentry box with a wooden seat in it and under the seat was a bucket and i'm sure you can gather what that was for primitive to be sure but the bucket oh the bucket was lovely and shiny it was a lovely bucket i have to say it was known as an elsan and the landlady one mrs parry used to empty it on her rhubarb patch and i must say the rhubarb seemed to be flourishing but i remember my mother and i watching her emptying the contents of the lovely shiny bucket onto her rhubarb as she called it and shortly after her coming into my mother and saying oh mrs walter would you like some fresh rhubarb my mother said uh, thank you, Mrs. Parry. It's very nice of you. Very, very, very nice of you. But I, I'm not really very partial to rhubarb. Rhubarb, uh, I'm afraid. So, no, neither was I. Anyway, to return to the Viking Age, a recent discovery on the island of Zealand in Denmark changed ideas on the "do it anywhere" idea, when a six-foot-deep hole was found in what would have been a rural location. When the material at the bottom of the hole was analyzed, it proved to be human waste. Yes, let rejoicing commence. They had found a cesspit. Well, they jumped straight into it and scientifically dated it to the Viking Age. It was established as human rather than animal because it contained flower pollen that showed the consumption of honey. Though whether it had been eaten or taken in meat wasn't possible to say, but honey was never given to animals. And the pollen wasn't airborne, which indicated that the hole had been enclosed, presumably in a structure of some kind. The subsequent discovery of post holes to either side of the hole confirmed that it had indeed been situated inside some form of structure. So it would seem that even in the countryside, the old Norse used privies rather than do it where you were though of course that that's not to say that every farmstead had one they probably didn't but the the idea of people always just doing it wherever they were was incorrect and that idea didn't really fit in with the considerable level of cleanliness and personal hygiene among the norse people in other regards you know, people often see the Vikings as scruffy, unkept men, you know, interested in nothing other than going around in dragon-headed uh, dragon ships and, and burning and looting and all that sort of thing. But that's very far from the truth. The Norse were actually the cleanest people of their day, I mean, combing their hair regularly, changing their clothes frequently, and washing their hands and faces every day, and taking a bath once a week. An unheard of thing elsewhere. You know, I mean, the Anglo-Saxons, for example, they were they were astonished at this unnecessary goings on. I mean, you know, they 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 they, they couldn't they couldn't understand this. There was no point to it. An annual bath was more than good enough for them. Well, maybe two if they were real clean freaks. And it has been suggested that many people in those days never actually had any immersion in water since their baptism. Mm, charming that was and i mean why why keep taking your clothes on and off on and off on and off you just put them on and then leave them on i mean look at all the work that saved there is actually a complaint about norse cleanliness on record recorded by an english monk and chronicler named john of wallingford who was writing in 1002 a.d just after the infamous saint bryce's day massacre when king ethelred the unready who should perhaps better be known as Ethelred the Extremely Dimwitted, rather foolishly ordered an attack on Danes living quite peacefully in his kingdom, thus bringing rather considerable retaliation down on himself, which he richly deserved. Now, some Anglo-Saxons were probably quite happy to kill the local Norsemen, not just because the king thought it was a good idea, you know, they probably didn't give a rat's ass what the king thought, but because of the far greater Norse cleanliness. Yes, the cleanliness. Since the Saxon women were actually going off with the Norse men in preference to their own men. He wrote, and I quote, The Norsemen caused much trouble to the natives of the land, for they were wont, after the fashion of their country, 
to comb their hair every day, to bathe every Saturday, to change their garments often, and set off their persons by many frivolous devices. In this manner they laid siege to the virtue of the married woman, and persuaded the daughters, even of the nobles, to be their concubines. Well, I mean, you couldn't have that sort of thing going on now, could you? Of course, had the Anglo-Saxon tried to wash them a bit more often and maybe changing their clothes even once a year, possibly, uh, things might have been better. I'm sure the Norsemen were much more pleasant to be with than the local men, especially indoors on a hot day, since houses in those times didn't really have any windows. Combs, tweezers, and, and earwax uh, removing tools are very common items recovered from Norse graves. And in fact, the, the type of small comb, usually called a dust comb, the sort of thing that you would like get fleas out of your, your cat with, is actually an old Norse design, used uh, over a thousand years ago and still in use today. Though, well, no longer, you know, made from bone or horn and not as elaborately decorated. But the twin-sided design, even the shape, is exactly the same as many examples of combs recovered from burial sites. From all of this, we can very safely say that personal hygiene and general sanitation was of a very high standard for that day among the Norse. That does raise an interesting question. Would the old Norse have been less affected by illness due to bad hygiene than other people of that age, given their daily hand washing, for example, and their personal grooming? Well, logic would seem to say yes. I mean, since, well, washing your hands, for example, was and still is a vital part of reducing the risk of infection from, from any sort. So it does seem likely that whatever nasty little things turned up in that legendary Jorvik poo, the old Norse were probably far less at risk than some other people at that time. I don't see how one could argue to the contrary on uh, that point. So... And with that thought, we come to the end of this little look at illness in the Viking Age. I hope you found it uh, interesting, and I didn't put you off your dinner. And until next time, I shall say farewell. Goodbye, until next time. I hope to see you in the next video.